Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Soul Focused Radio. This is your host, Martin Friedman, and I'm excited to be here with you. As you see, I'm flying solo today. Um, I am out here in Seattle, the Seattle area, in a hotel room. I'm doing some work uh, that I'm very excited about that I'm going to share with you in a not too distant future. And um, I'm here to introduce a podcast episode that is with Chantel Pratt, who is a new friend, a new colleague, and a neuroscientist. And I was so excited to have this conversation. Unfortunately, I really wanted um, Kristen and uh, Martina uh, to join. They just couldn't join. It didn't work out. And some other folks from Soul Focus Group. But we are going to have part two, part three, you know, hopefully into the future. And what we talked about today is we talked about how powerful the mind is. Um, which was a fascinating conversation for me. Uh, as you'll see, I mentioned that I, I don't, you know, I'm not a scientist and I wouldn't think maybe I'd be the best person to have this conversation, but I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, Chantel was awesome. So I'm not going to keep you anymore with that. I just want you to sit back and enjoy our conversation about how powerful the mind is. Well, Chantel, it is so good to see you. Um, thank you so much for joining us on Soul Focus Radio. And I uh, just want to start with a, an introduction. Just tell us who you are and anything you want us to know about you. Martin, thank you so much for having me. I just want to say thank you for being patient with my scheduling challenges. I'm so honored to be here and have a conversation with you about some of the things awesome. that we both share in common. Uh, my name is Chantel Pratt. I am a professor at the University of Washington. That's the one that's actually in Washington for those of you who get confused with Washington University. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology, Linguistics, and Neuroscience. And this is not because I'm an overachiever, but instead because I study a really niche field, and that is how our brains make us us. And that I find that the intersection of those three areas is really important for understanding how differences in the way our brains work relate to how we see ourselves and operate in the world around us. Mm, that's awesome. That's really awesome. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time to, uh, you know, cause I know, I know how busy you are. So thank you for taking the time to do this, uh, Chantel. And, um, you know, so we met in, uh, we met last year in Seattle and, um, you know, we were talking to you, uh, through Soul Focus Group and through another entity that we're a part of. So when I met you, um, we were talking about how the mind works and we were talking about subconscious programming and we had asked for your expertise, uh, especially because we talk a lot about the subconscious mind. But what I really wanted to talk to you about today is how powerful the mind is. So when I say that phrase to you, how powerful the mind is, what, what comes to you? Whew, it almost gives me the goosebumps. So when I think of the mind... What I think about is the parts of the world we operate in, our memories and ideas about that world um, that your brain makes consciously available to you. So I think of the mind as this buffer between the human being and the world that they occupy. And importantly, and I think one thing that people don't necessarily realize is that your brain creates your mind as a tool for maximizing your success as an individual. Your brain does not create the mind as a tool for representing the truth or the world out there. Instead, it selects certain pieces of information, certain parts of your memory, certain aspects of your values or beliefs that are consistent with whatever it thinks your goal is at this time. And it sort of, you know, it displays or it makes available to your conscious awareness, whatever it thinks is going to drive the best decision for you based on your lifetime of experiences. 
Hmm. No big deal. Hmm. That's what I think of. It's a little, <laughs> I mean, it's a little, you know, it's a little, uh, it's clearly, I guess, mm -hmm. um, fully transparent. Of course, my idea of the mind is coming through my lens of what I study. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I find it fascinating how people have the, the perception. We have the experience that our eyes are like a film lens right like a like a video camera lens and our ears are like a microphone and that we are just sampling the world as it is but this is absolutely false mm -hmm. it, the the truth is that we have a brain that takes bite-sized chunks of the world outside and then fills in the blank and creates mm -hmm. our unique perception of reality mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a famous saying, and I forget who said it, but that our our minds are meaning making machines, and that's what I'm thinking about when you're when you're saying that. So when we talk about how powerful the mind is, that's a powerful machine to to be making meaning like that. It's it's so driven to make meaning, and um, and I think that this works for us well because if it didn't, it, in certain circumstances, hold the phone right it works for us well because it's it's creating meaning where there's ambiguity and if it didn't do that we would be confused all the damn time and if we took in all the information and and came up with an accurate representation of the world we would be called to act upon a world that was 5 15 20 minutes ago mm -hmm. right which would not serve us well when we're crossing the street but there might be other situations in which we're thinking, feeling, and behaving where we can afford to take that 20 minutes and think about it a little more deeply, right? Like our mind evolved to navigate us through the world quickly enough so that we don't get squished by mm -hmm. something that's happening around us. Um, but of course, in those shortcuts and in those assumptions is a lot of inaccuracy and a lot of perpetuation where the things that we experienced in the past drive what not only what we believe but what we actually see so I like to talk about um I like to start with a fun example that which is that dress that took the internet by storm because mm -hmm. people couldn't sure. agree about whether it was blue and black or white and gold um and you're like what you know you're looking at that and I see blue and black my husband sees white and gold. My husband, who is also a neuroscientist and understands how this works, says to me, like, I can't believe the actual dress is wrong <laughs> because the dress is blue and black in real life, which I think paints the picture that the reality that we perceive is so damn convincing to us. If it wasn't, again, we'd walk around feeling confused. We wouldn't know how to operate. But if something as low level as color of a dress is open for interpretation is interpreted partly by your brain and if people with different experiences in this case people with different experiences in light and shadow because if you see the dress as white and gold your brain has decided that it is backlit and it subtracts the blue and black out it doesn't ask you about that it doesn't even make you feel confused it just does it and gives you the answer white and gold. And if you think about it for a second, how powerful is the mind? The, the dress arose because the woman who was wearing that dress took a picture of herself and sent it to a friend. Should I wear this dress to the wedding that we're going to? And her friend who saw the dress is blue and black, her friend who saw the dress is white and gold is like, of course you can't wear that dress to a wedding. You don't wear white to a wedding, you know? And, <laughs> and so, you know, how powerful is the mind based on our interpretation of that dress? We make a decision about whether to wear it to, you know, our friend says yay or nay to wearing it to a wedding, you know? So if something as basic as the color of a dress is open for different interpretations, imagine how your impression of a human, like the most complex thing that we can understand with our brains or your impression of a political system, or your impression mm. of an ideology, or your your impression of a civilization, or your impression of a work of art. Like, just imagine how that scales up to something that is not like 
linked in a one-on-one -on -one way to a physical property of the universe, like color of a dress is, you know? I mean, how powerful is the mind? Mm -hmm. It is the, the, um, it is the information that our conscious operating systems use to control our behavior. Mm. Yeah, you have me thinking of so many things right now. Um, also, you know, I, I want to frame this. I, I probably should have said it earlier, but I am, I consider myself to be the opposite of a scientist. So um, it's one of the reasons why I'm excited to have this conversation with you. I was thinking about bringing other people on that have more scientific minds than I do. I do not have what I would consider to be a scientific mind. I barely passed science just to get out of high school, to be honest with you, like barely. So it's an exciting for me to have this conversation with you. And one of the things I really want to give you props for, uh, Chantel, is how you put this in terms that even I can understand, you know, which is which is really great. Um, so I just want to say that because I am the farthest thing probably from a neuroscientist that you could ever imagine. Mm. And, and I also spend a lot of my time talking about what you just talked about, which is how we get locked in to what we think is an absolute truth, but it's actually, it's, it, it is perception based truth. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit in, in, in the most simplistic way possible? So how, how is it that we can look at a dress that's black and blue and or blue and black and, and some people could see it differently. And then, you know, we have like the Yanni Laurel example and yes, stuff like that. Yeah, how, yeah. how is it that, that, that we can perceive something so differently and, um, and then can it change? And then can you be just as sure after that, that the dress is actually not a white dress, but it's a black dress and then switch it to, oh no, it's absolutely a black dress, not a white dress. I don't know if I said that right or not, yeah, but you understand yeah, what I'm asking. Yeah, 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 I do. Martin, I'm going to challenge the fact that you're not, you're the farthest thing away from a scientist. I think we think science is this like abstract thing that lives in the ivory tower. And that is a problem yeah. with the systems that yeah. we operate in, not with science. I think you're a scientist of yourself and you're a scientist of humanity. Sure, and sure. of course you're like any, any kind of, anyway, I'm just going to say that because I think sure, science sure. should be, I think science and scientists should be better. <laughs> anyway, Absolutely. You I know think what? all the and scientists I, should be more like Martin. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, Anne. My older brother is a, a you know has his PhD in uh, theoretical physics, so Ooh. as part of it is having that in the house is like my older brother. Like, oh no, you've got that. I will go this way. You go that way. So, but so here's you're the right. connection. I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think the way we should understand other human beings is like particle physics. I think that mm -hmm. what we want, what happens is that our, in, our most instinctive way of understanding other human beings is through mirroring and empathy and like put yourself in their shoes, but you can build a model, an abstract model of how other human beings work that can be more accurate if you're interacting with a human that doesn't work like you. That's point two. Let's go back like to point that. one, like which that. is, okay. which is the dress. Um, the reason that people, and I know more about the actual acoustic, not acoustic, I know more about the actual neural mechanism of the dress than I do Laurel Yanni, although I think that that has to do with pitch. Um, hmm. But the reason that people see the dress differently, right? Like we, most people learned at some point in your life, you, you put a white light through a prism and saw a rainbow and learned that color hmm. is related to wavelengths of light and that people with trichromatic color vision have cones in the back of their eye that literally absorb that light and send a signal to your brain. So how in the heck can we have different understanding of the dress given, you know, typical color vision even? The answer is that it's not that simple. It's never that simple in the brain, again, because of this connecting the dots process. Instead, our brains make inferences. Our brains learn your, to, to the question of change. They learn throughout our lifespan that the color of light bouncing off, the characteristics of the light bouncing off of something are more likely to change than the color of an object itself. Otherwise, we would see our green apple turn red in the sunset and turn blue in a shadow. We don't see that. What our brain does, and I think this is important for how we understand the world broadly, is it, it, it uses context for any object, it looks, it takes a sample of all of the colors of wavelengths of light around it that are hitting your eyes. And it does a kind of least common denominator. It subtracts out like, well, everything around me is kind of reddish. 
probably mm -hmm. the light hitting this situation is reddish and it automatically subtracts that out. And then it's like, what's left? Oh, this is actually a blue globe or a green apple. You know, I've decided because everything has this common denominator to take it out. So what's interesting about the picture of the dress and anybody who's listening to this can just type in the dress and mm -hmm. it will come up, sure. um, is that there's no context. It's a picture of a torso um, and there's kind of a brightish light over the shoulder. But what's interesting, uh, vision researcher Pascal Wallish did a kind of an informal survey of thousands of people and found out that um, you can predict whether people will see uh, white and gold. So people who see white and gold, they think that light is coming from behind. They assume the dress is in a shadow. And because things in shadow have this kind of blue blackish tinges, they subtract it out. And people who see the dress, wait, people see the dress as white and gold. They just subtract the blue and black. People who see the dress as blue and black just assume that it's in kind of overhead or, or artificial lighting and don't do any automatic subtraction. So uh, this uh, author and researcher queried people, asked them about their experience with light, um, asked them about whether they were night owls or morning people. The, the inference is that if you're up a lot at night, it, after the sun is down, you spend time in artificially lit rooms. Of, of course, there are people like me who are up super early, but also spend time in artificially lit rooms. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, you can you can explain some prediction, some percent of the variability in what color people see based on their experiences with light, natural light, things in shadows or artificial light, artificial light, you're more likely to see blue and black natural light, you're more likely to see white and gold. And can it change? Yes, but is the answer, right? So these, um, it's not going to change because I explained to you how it works. Of that, I feel confident. And I mm. should say that there are people who also see the dress as um, blue. There's in between, right? It's not always mm. all or nothing. Some people see something that's kind of like a light blue and gold. And that means their brain is kind of on the fence or they say it's, you know, they do a partial but not total subtraction. Um, so your brain, I'm going to give you a quote from Monica Guzman's book. I never thought of it that way. We don't see through our eyes. We see through our biographies. I mean, that was just so powerful to me. Um, and so at any given time, the, the, the data that your brain is using to connect the dots or fill in the blanks is based on your lifetime of experiences, not only lived experiences, but imagined experiences television, art, like any mental experience, the power of the mind. Let's go back to that. Mm -hmm. Your mental experiences shape your brain in a way that shapes the way you view reality. Hmm. To a non, I wouldn't say non-distinguishable, but to a very similar degree, your mental experiences to a, shape your brain to a very similar degree as your lived experiences, right? The mental experience is kind of this buffer between your lived experience and the memories that you lay down in the brain. So you can change these statistics that your brain uses um, to make inferences in the world, but you're working against a lifetime of lived and imagined experiences, right? So um, when it comes to the least fun version of these kind of filling in the blanks, would, which would be like our host of implicit biases about others based on how they look, you know, based on, I think a lot of those come from not lived experiences, but experiences that we are fed through the media hmm. um, through someone else's version of what reality is. Um, there has been work looking to see how our experiences might shape or reshape our implicit biases. But again, you're working against this number of statistics that you've taken in a lifetime. So you would have to make a concerted effort to feed your brain uh, positive or more representative experiences. And it's not like I read one book or I interact with one person and now my lifetime of previous statistics is going to be reversed. I mm -hmm. think it's really important to know that every single mental experience shapes our brain. Every single um, 
thing that we fear, that we hope for, that we envision shapes our brain. And we know this about our lives. Like some of these are just kind of incremental experiences. You probably had no clue that the way you saw things in light or shadow might change the way you see the dress. But sometimes we have a pivotal incremental experience, you know, one experience that sort of knocks down a series of dominoes that changes the way we see ourselves and our position in the world. And that then, you know, has these, this cascade of effects on, on the mind. But you are not, just because your brain and your lifetime of statistics shapes the way you see the world, that does not mean you're stuck. Every single experience is stored in your brain. It changes the statistics and the way you see the world. Okay, so thank you for that. Again, you have me thinking about a million things. We're going to have to do probably a part two and part three and Great. you know, bring in some other folks too. Um, just so just so our listeners uh, and our viewers know, um, we had planned on having some of our other co-hosts on here, but they just couldn't make it for a variety of reasons. So part of the reason why I'm going solo today too. Um, so you said that the mind, your definition of the mind is essentially the conscious mind, right? What we mm. consciously perceive. You've also said the brain. You've, you've talked about the brain. Mm. So can you talk about what is the difference between the mind and the brain and where does the subconscious mind fit into all of this? Mm, that's such a good question. Yeah, when I, I, a lot of times when I am thinking about the mind, I'm thinking about really the tip of the iceberg and what drives our behavior. And that's um, not even... I mean, yes, our conscious mind are sort of the way we represent the sounds, sights, and, you know, feelings, even the way we talk about our feelings, um, or experience our feelings or tell ourselves what we're feeling. Um, but it, it, it's, this is sort of like our conscious experience. And this is what our storytelling is based on. I think a lot of how we tell ourselves what kind of person we are or why we did what we did is based on this conscious part, which is a small percentage of the information processing of our brains and is a small percentage of what drives our behavior. So um, the vast majority of our learning of, and of our sort of um, deciding works like every other behaving animal on the planet. And that is that we are um, constantly sort of, um, I think at the beginning of this, I said the mind is this place that um, your brain creates your mind in a way that it thinks will drive your, your success, right? Hmm. So the way I like to think about this is the way that most behaving animals work and the way that we work, the, math, the vast majority of our behavior is that our brain has a playbook. And it represents not every feature of the world, because if you think about it, there are a lot of things in the world around you right now that are not relevant to what you need to do next, right? Mm -hmm. So it is representing what it thinks is important in the world around you to drive your decision about what to do next. So mm -hmm. given that I am on a podcast with Martin Friedman and you know we're talking about the power of the mind and blah, 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 blah. There's a series of things that I could say next, right? And my brain knows that. Now, as you can tell from how quickly I'm speaking and how mm -hmm. much I'm speaking, mm -hmm. it has an idea. My brain very quickly and automatically will say, you know what? Like, if you start singing Beyonce Halo right now, that could be great. But you've learned from <laughs> previous experiences that it's not going to be as great as Beyonce. And not really on topic. And, you know, so my brain has a list of possible things I could do. And it will select for me or make easy for me the thing that it thinks is going to maximize my success and minimize my failures. Most of this is happening quickly and implicitly. Mm -hmm. Then... It either works out better than I expected, worse than I expected, or exactly as I expected. There's a lot of noise, right? You can do the exact same thing in the exact same place. We never really do that. Everything's a little different. Now it's Tuesday, not Monday. Now there's a different audience or whatever. I mean, you know, you guys do this for a living, talking to lots of different people, having the same message, but every there's a different recipe and everything, right? There's always an, a, 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 an element of uncertainty. If everything goes exactly how you plan, there's no learning. There's no feeling. 
It's just like, boop, I nailed it. But that's rare. Usually it's either better than I expected and my brain gives me these good feeling chemicals that rewire it, or it's worse than I expected, even if it's good. If it's not as good as I expected, let's say, <clears throat> you'll have to take my, my word for it, but let's say my version of Halo was good, but not good <laughs> as I expected. My brain would give me a dip in that, that dopamine, it would make that behavior less available. So all of this stuff happens under the hood, meaning it's in the subconscious. Mm -hmm. And if you have a feeling, if you have a mental experience, it's what people would call gut feeling or intuition. A lot of people don't even, don't even tune into that. But that is driving the vast majority of our behavior. And what I think is interesting about this is um, that there's a part of the brain that Michael Gazzaniga, a very famous neuroscientist called the interpreter, um, he studied patients who had their brain severed down the middle mm. to control epilepsy. So they basically have two brains in one. Mm. And if you ask, if you present information to one if you present information to their left hemisphere, which is speaking in most of them, they'll tell you what they saw, they'll tell you why they responded the way they did, so forth and so on. If you present information to the right side of their brain and then ask their left hand to do something, it will do something. But then their left hemisphere is watching that going and it's making up a story. The interpreter mm. is making up a story about why they did what they did. And on the fly, and he's, you know, it's so quickly that. If you didn't know, you know, the whole story, you would just assume that that was their truth. But mm. in an intact brain, we do that too. Mm. Because we're not aware of all of this decision, all this playbook stuff that is driving our behavior. We're aware of the, the power of the mind is this little part on top that is our conscious awareness, our values, our explicit goals does control and can override that automatic behavior. But what I find fascinating is that in some degree, that part of your brain is watching you behave and telling you a story about why you're doing what you're doing with incomplete information after you've done it. Maybe mm. 250 milliseconds after you've done it, it's like, you're doing this because you're a great person. You work hard or whatever, but a huge part of it is like my previous experience said, this is the best play. Ooh, okay. So, all right. So let me, let me kind of say this back to you and tell me what you think. So mm -hmm. my interpretation of, of what you just said is that when we talk about how powerful the mind is, it, if we're thinking of the mind as it's really that conscious, it's the portal mm -hmm. into all the other aspects of our brain. So the reason why the the mind is so powerful is because that's that's the piece that we're conscious of and it allows us an entryway into changing our behavior which is actually rooted in another part of the brain which is the subconscious mind Correct. because that's like 95 to 98 percent right it's only two to five percent in our conscious so the two to five percent to me uh wouldn't feel that powerful because it's a smaller number but you're saying it's powerful because it's the entryway into being able to influence other parts of our brain um, and, and you said a lot of other things that were, <laughs> but that's the piece I was really thinking about. Like you said, a lot of other things about how we kind of are observing ourselves and we get the, we get this information right after. And what I'm, what I'm really honing in on is, is that, is that, a, an interpretation of what you mean when you say, when we talk about how powerful the mind is? Oh my gosh. Like, I don't think I said that you said it way better than me. So now I'm going to start asking you questions about the brain. <laughs> um, but Scary. this is you're exactly right. So humans have, I talked about how all behaving animals sort of have this playbook and we move, you know, in this context, this is what's yeah. right. But humans have this, uh, you know, powerful frontal lobe that will actually, you know, I don't know if it's two to 5%. I don't know how we would actually ever quantify it. Mm. Um, but I know that it is energetically really expensive and hard to behave in this mindful conscious mm -hmm. deliberate way um but we can so for instance 
if I said to you, Martin, next time I say Beyonce halo, you need to like put a little halo in the sky over your head. You could do that. Like there's nothing in your lived experience that has rewarded. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there is something in your lived experience that rewarded you for that, but I'm going to go on a limb and say, you've never played that game before, (laughs) but the human mind can reprogram itself with language or instructions or modeling of someone else. Like we can do something that we've, so think about that. Like you have a part of your brain that understands the word halo. You have a part of your brain that um, moves your hands to be up above your head, right? Um, But you have probably never paired those things together. And you think about the brain as a physical organ, but we can orchestrate that organ to combine the pieces of things we knew before into a new behavior. And that is expensive as heck. It's so hard. It, it, it takes probably a third of the real estate of your frontal lobe. It's super flexible because we can do an infinite number of things. Like I could play this game all day long. And as long as I'm combining, you know, some piece of something you know how to do, we could do brand new things all day long. And I think, yes, that's why the mind is powerful because we can do an literally almost infinite number of new things when we're put in front of new information. But I think it's important to know that that's not easy and Mm -hmm. that when you learn something new, you would have to hold, okay, so let's go back to the, my previous example, you would have to hold that rule in mind consciously because there's nothing in your playbook to do it. So if I see you next week at dinner and I say, Beyonce, halo, and you don't go like this. It's because you forgot, right? Or you have to practice somehow like walking around the world, making a halo has to be like, everyone says, what the heck are you doing? And you engage in these really rewarding conversations. And suddenly Mm -hmm. that is your jam. And like, now it's in your playbook. You either have to practice and get good feedback enough times that that becomes a part of your playbook or you have to hold that in mind. So like much like you walk into the kitchen, you're watching TV and you go into the kitchen for something and you're like, what the heck am I doing here? Cause it falls out of your mind mm-hmm. that those ways of behaving are fragile. They, you know, they take a lot of mental energy. Like if it's the end of the day, you're sleep deprived, you're hungry. Like, you know, you haven't eaten well, like you, it, it takes a lot to hold that, that mental program in mind Mm. but you can do an infinite number of things and you can use that to override your Mm. your playbook or your most automatic way of behaving Mm. okay okay awesome so more questions but i just want to i want to get on this 95 to 98 percent thing real quick yeah so so you say you don't know that that is now we 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 quote this number all the time i believe it comes from the book uh thinking fast and slow daniel kahneman Mm -hmm. and i this is this was a book that was read by people that are much more patient readers than I am. So I am getting that information from people that actually read mm-hmm. the book, mm-hmm. I believe. So if, if, if you're saying that you don't know that it's precisely 95 to 98 percent, but would you would you agree that it's somewhere probably pretty close? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a very high majority. Right. Mm-hmm. It's this mm-hmm. very small percentage that we're right. in our conscious mind. OK, mm-hmm. I just want to be sure on that one. But you're just not you. you as a neuroscientist aren't willing to say to walk around saying oh i know for sure this is 95 percent." i think it's i think i would even go so far as to say it's impossible to get a perfect quantity right because Mm. a a lot of our behaviors are 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 the convergence of these things sometimes Mm. what i call the horse and the rider or the you know subconscious and conscious are in alignment so how do you know what's driving the behavior at any given time so you might Mm. talk about what percentage of time people solve a problem in a sort of instinctive or controlled way but like I, you know, if you, how would you quantify every single decision of every person's life and like what percentage of it? I think it would just be hard. I think it's Mm. a very fair estimate, but I'm always like, how do they come up with that number? I've also, I think the book is fantastic. Um, yeah, but anyway, so I'm not, I'm not (laughs) challenging that it's 50, 50 for (laughs) by any means, but they're not always in conflict.
All right, so we don't have a lot of time left, but I wanna I wanna really tie this into like human solidarity, and I wanna tie this into how do we start to use how powerful the mind is as a way to get to a place where we're together. I wanna just use myself as a very quick case study, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, in terms of being able to change behavior, so I I identify myself as a recovering conflict addict, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, early on in my life, what, whatever reason, you know, the childhood trauma I went through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Somewhere along the line, my default came, became conflict. And to the point where I started, I would seek it out. And I yeah. kind of loved, I learned to love conflict and anger as my default. And I, and I lumped those together. Right. Yeah. And it just, it felt like a natural part of life to be in conflict. And then you work through it. And, uh, you know, what you said, like after, after the conflict, sometimes I would be like, oh, that wasn't good. Or, you know, in the past that it worked, but it didn't work this time. Now I have to go through this whole process of recovering from it. Um, so during COVID, uh, I was traveling 90% before COVID. And in, and at, during COVID, I was a home 100% <laughs> for the first three or four months. And my wife and I got along really well, but our whole marriage had been with me on the road more than I was at home. Mm -hmm. I know this is a common story, but basically one day she said to me, she said, Martin, she said, I don't want you to, to, to express anger towards me the way you're expressing it. Now I felt natural and healthy to me, good conflict. We'd work things out afterwards, but she said this, you know, I can't take it. It's not, it's triggering for me. I don't like it. And, and you need to change. And, you know, after defensiveness, um, what I did, Chantel, is I would get in my car and I would drive. This was when I was living in Pittsburgh. And sorry, Pittsburghers, but I think you all are the second worst drivers after Seattleites. Oh, sorry, my gosh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Seattleites oh, and Pittsburghers. <laughs> I've driven all over this country and a couple other places in the world. And I stand by it. Um, but so I would go places where I know people would drive horribly and like cut me off and stuff. And I, I would literally say, hello, hello, car. Welcome to the road in front of me, car. Um, you know, I wonder what's going on for you. I bet you are really in an important hurry right now. You are, you just cut me off because you probably have to get to the hospital or someone in your yeah. car is about to deliver a child. And I would create a story, story. and I would welcome them to the, to the, um, you know, to the road in front of me. The point of why asking you this is like <laughs> conflict. My brain told me the conflict had served me my whole life. And then I get a message that says, no, 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 it's not healthy. It's not good. And you have somebody in your life that you really love and want to stay married to that doesn't want that from you anymore. So now you have to change. Mm -hmm. And that was about our solidarity as a couple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I just wonder like, if you could sort of take that story and extrapolate it out to where I was, where I was going and how that could feed into our, our, our uh, how powerful the mind is, how that, how that ties into our quest for um, for returning to human solidarity. Uh, yes, and thank thank goodness for your wife and her ability to express herself. So, mm. what I hear in um, your story is first defensiveness, and then and then listening. And and I think like the most important one, not I don't know the most important one important message to take away is, and I've had very not not exactly the same conversation with my husband, but very similar like this makes me as a woman with these previous experiences, like your level of energy here is like make, making all kinds of things happen inside of me. And I think it's very important to understand that you might, your first response be, might be like, we're just having a conversation. Like, don't accuse me of this, hmm. you know, of being violent or angry, like I would ever hurt you. But I think the first thing is to understand that there are two minds that are representing the world in two different ways through the lens of what has protected them or served them in the past. And I think the most important thing there is to understand that it is not as you may not be able to agree on what the reality out here is, but you must start with with an agreement that everyone's reality is the, is their own reality. And that matters probably more than what is out here in the world between you, right? Mm. So as in, in terms of human solidarity, I believe that when we have a part of the mind that um, is related to our identity, um, that we, pro we protect that in a way that doesn't allow us to take in new information and say, oh, maybe I'm not 
conflict of, you know, maybe I'm not this anymore. Maybe I think that we, um, our, our, our identity is so central to belonging, which is a, an essential human, uh, need, right. That instead of trying to reach alignment between this person's perspective and your your perspective, our, our instinct might be protect this. You know, I hear you saying something about me that makes me rethink my identity. And if I'm wrong, then I'm this, all this other things. Mm -hmm. So I think that like being in a situation where you can be curious and res responsive to another person's perspective and to understand that two very different perspectives are possible and that probably the true, the objective truth is something in between, right? And that that kind of doesn't matter, that what matters to this person is the way that their brain is representing reality. And your goal shouldn't be, let me convince you mm. that my version of how I behaved is important. Instead, let's come to a, an understanding of how we can, like, let me communicate what I thought, let you communicate what you thought. And how do we come to an agreement about how to make us both feel safe, heard, mm. and, and connected? I think that, you know, what you tell in that story is beautiful. Hopefully, it, you know, hopefully it changed some things, but it it, it, what's beautiful about that is that there was no part about trying to convince the other person that they're right or wrong. I get a million, yes. a million questions about how do I change someone's mind? And I just think that is, you've already started in the wrong place. It's like, how do I understand that this person's reality is their reality? And it's based on their li lived experiences and their, the way their brain has remembered and processed things. And instead let's come to appreciate that every person's reality is, is there is convinced as convincing to them as the color that you see that dress mm. and how to get people to explore their own reality and feel curious rather than threatened by our different perspectives and find a way to mm. move forward that where everybody feels safe, I think is really important. And in order to do that, we have to be willing individually and collectively to kind of reprioritize that powerful mind of ours, because okay. well, you said something really powerful and that you know, I'm almost 60 years old. I'll be, I'll, I'll be 60 in September and it's taking me this long in my life to start to change my priority from being right, mm -hmm. because I've spent almost my entire life with the goal of proving that I'm right mm -hmm. and also not being wrong, mm -hmm. which I think is a two slightly different things. Yeah. Cause I think that not being wrong is tied into like feelings of shame and being right is like more for me. It's, it's about, see, you know, this is, you know, this is, you know, my way of seeing things is the correct way of seeing things. So I see them slightly different, mm -hmm. differently, but I, but that's been the driving force. And that's why the, the conflict, you know, hence the conflict addiction, mm -hmm. Because, but I, you know, that is changing for me. And so what you said is right on. So at some point, at some point, we have to agree as human beings that are living in the same country, same state, same city, same whatever, that are going to interact with each other. At some point, we have to agree that the priority isn't to prove, to be right and prove that we're right, but it's actually to find, to get those powerful minds of ours together to find what the common ground is. That's right. That's absolutely right. And I think, I mean, so like I wrote this book, The Neuroscience of You, and it's funny because the only thing I, I shouldn't say this, but the, the thing I care about the most is the last chapter, which is called Connect. But there are all, like, I don't know, nine chapters before that that are basically explaining all of the gaps between your subjective reality and the mm -hmm. physical world, like, you know, we start with the color of a dress and we move on because I feel like, um, so this quote I, I love from Ted Lasso, who, who ascribes it to Walt Whitman, be curious, not judgmental. Mm -hmm. And what I hoped was like, if I told people all the ways that your brain is building this reality, and this is just one way that they could let go a little bit of this idea that you're right. Like, cause I think I have this unique perspective. Like how could you be convinced of anything? <laughs> cause your brain mm. is making crap up all the time, you know? Mm. And if, and, and if through that, like, let me relax my assumption that my version of the truth is the capital T truth. Mm. I think it makes space for connecting with people who have different lived experiences and different, different interpretations of the world. Mm. 
it lets us be curious, even for somebody who is behaving. I mean, I think that there's difference between being curious and giving someone permission to harm psychologically, et cetera. But if you find somebody who is behaving offensively or makes you feel threatened, you don't have to um, give them that power or, um, or allow them into your space in a way that affects you negatively. But can you, instead of saying, this is a terrible human being, then say like, what about this person's lived experience or the way their brain is processed? How has this served this person in the past? Like what might their representation of this space be? What might be driving that behavior? It's just, it's not the same thing as saying this is okay. But it's right. saying like, what it, can I imagine a, a, a situation in which this person has grown up to be like this? Yes. Yes. I love that. I love that. They're there, there, but for the grace of fill in the blank, go I, right. Because mm -hmm. that's, you know, one of the things for me is, you know, it, that practice of not being angry has been a practice of, I've been replacing it with sending love to that person and thinking like, oh, how did you get to this point? Yeah. You must um, not be very happy with yourself either. No. Yeah. My, my mother just recently moved into like a quote unquote, like retirement home, like assisted living type of place. And she was, we, her and I were having a conversation about the people that work there. And I said to her, you know, like, you know, cause she has a lot of, uh, you know, she's been on her own forever and now she's not on her own anymore. She has to rely on people to bring her food and stuff. And she has a lot of complaints. And I, and I asked her, I said, do you ever think about how somebody came to work here? Like how many people, how many of these people that are working here, do you think when they were six years old, said, I can't wait to grow up and work in the dining area of a retirement home in Chagrin mm -hmm. Falls, Ohio, mm -hmm. right? And so so just to think about like, you know, and again, maybe there are some people that did. I don't want to, I don't want to ascribe, but I just, you know, in my experience, I want to, I want to be able to look at somebody and say, what got you here in this moment? Whether that's somebody that just cut me off or whether that's somebody that I feel like isn't doing what I want them to do in a job that I, that a, per, a job I personally wouldn't want to do, you know, um, and I would only do if I had to survive. So just, you know, and I guess, I mean, I, this is, you know, we, we only have a minute or two left, so we can't get into it, but I'm thinking about love. I'm thinking about empathy mm -hmm. and how does that tie into the power, power of the mind? Is that, is that a one or two minute answer for you at all? I, can <laughs> tell, that, I think love is that, amazing. I mean, I, so I think that you're, I, when you were saying that somebody cut me off for this, like I do the same thing and it's just yeah, like, we, yeah. and there's something called the fundamental attributional error, which is like, when we do it, we understand the context Right. Yeah. We understand why we, you know, somebody might say, why are you being rude to me? And and the truth is like, you're worried about your mom or you're not, you're not present. You're not, you didn't even yeah. think you were being rude. Right. So yeah. um, I think that like um, imagining the best possible reason why somebody did the way they did can get you a lot farther because you're never going to meet that person, and, right. you know, probably right. unless you have right. road rage extreme. So thinking right. like, instead of just being like, oh, people are such jerks and what's everyone, you know, you, mm -hmm. you carry that that's, right. that's harming right. you. Empathy is so tricky um, because it turned again, like and let you you talked about human solidarity. Yeah. And that is the that is the goal. But this it, the way that mirroring and, and empathy works in most people is that whoever you decided are the us. Whoever it, it, empathy is something that brings you to the people who you decided are your in-group. But it also pulls you away from people who you've decided are your out group. So whatever your characteristics mm -hmm. are, are for deciding us versus them. And we've we've demonstrated this in, in the lab. If you watch someone get harmed and they're of an, another sex or another race, your brain responds mm -hmm. less strongly than mm -hmm. if they're mm -hmm. the people who you decide are your, are your people, mm -hmm. are your in-group. So I think empathy... Um, I guess I would, uh, I have not read this book, um, but there's a book called a case for, I think it's against empathy, a case for rational compassion, which is what you're doing, right? It doesn't mean that if someone cuts you off, it doesn't mean that you instantly feel, I love you, right? Mm -hmm. You don't feel that your instinct is probably still like, but then mm -hmm. your brain, you know, the, the mind, the power of the mind says, you know what, maybe this person is about to deliver, wife is about to deliver a baby or, you know, or, and, and that's rational compassion Personal right compassion. that's like mm -hmm. i am imagining a situation that in which this person is not having it you know either maybe they're just you know the kid is crying in the back and they didn't see i'm just in their blind spot you know so um 
So I think rational compassion, love, deciding who your in-group is, I think checking your instinct. So I have situations where um, I'll be walking alone on a street and I'll see a big dude um, across and, and my, and I feel no matter who, no matter what race they are, I feel like a little e eh, like that, that is somebody sure. who could harm me, but I can also say like, Oh, that guy kind of looks like my friend so-and-so or whatever, you know, and then, you know, how many big dudes do I know that I love and, and that are the kindest guys in the world. And, and I can, and that actually calms me down. Right. So you're, that's an idea of your mental, the power of what, you know, can, override it doesn't mean it's going to replace i mean you have to practice yeah. that a lot before you get into a feeling until you get into a space where someone cuts you off and you're like yeah hurry up go to the hospital you know yeah, but i yeah, think that, yeah. that 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 what you've explained is more like rational compassion mm, i love that i love that all right this this flew by this is amazing um real quick i lost you just for a second you said something about fundamental attribution can error. you say that term again error fundamental okay, att I attributional error is like somebody does something when somebody else behaves some way you say that person is a jerk it's like mm. a characteristic of them and when you behave that way, you say, you ascribe it to the context. Like I cut them off because I am in a hurry or mm. I didn't smile when that person said hello because I'm worried mm. about my grandmother. Like we mm -hmm. have way more context to interpret what's happening inside of us. And it's just easy to take a shortcut and, dis and decide that somebody behaves a certain way because they're a blank person. Mm. But it's irrational. That's obviously irrational. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Cause I'm not sure if the recording picked it up or not, but I, I lost it. So I wanted to make sure we got it. I just want to thank you. Like I said, this flew by, um, definitely want to do more with you in the, in the not too distant future. And I want to bring in the perspective of Kristen and Martina, who are the co-hosts and some other members of, of, uh, so focus group. So we can, you know, this was my perspective of just like excitingly just learning about this, but I think the way you broke down how powerful the mind is, is, it's accessible. Uh, it was humorous and um, and and very very easy for me to grasp. You know, given my my worldview. So I just want to thank you so much for taking the time and the energy for uh, for sitting with us for this podcast, this video cast. So thank you so much, Chantel. Thank you. I will definitely be back if you have a, a mechanism for getting questions from your listeners or when you listen back. If you're like, I want to follow up on this and that. I mean, I know that our paths are are intertwined in the foreseeable future. So yes. please. hundred percent, hundred percent. And we will, we'll put in the comment section for people to post, post questions so we can do follow up with you. But I just, again, thank you so much. Um, enjoy your day. Enjoy the coming holidays and the time you're spending with your daughter and just, just enjoy life. Thank you so much. See you All soon. Right. Talk to you again. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that conversation. I know I did. Um, I love Chantel. She is very down to earth. She is accessible. She makes a diff what, what could be a very difficult conversation very accessible. Uh, she has a good sense of humor. And I love her real world examples. So I just want to appreciate Chantel so much for taking the time and energy. She's very, very busy, very much in demand. So I so appreciate her. We appreciate her. Uh, for taking the time to come and talk with us. We definitely plan on having Chantel on in future episodes and having Kristen and Martina part of the conversation and maybe some other members of the Soul Focus group. So uh, the, the mind is certainly as powerful as we know. Uh, we're grounded in that idea at Soul Focus group. We know you know that because you're watching this and you're listening to this. And we are um, just so excited to have you on this journey with us. We love you, we care about you. We want very much for you to be a part of what we're doing, and we want you to help us to keep growing. We are growing and growing all the time. To that end, please go to soulfocusedgroup.com. Subscribe to us, like us on all the platforms, all that good stuff, please. Um, and just help us grow so that we can bring this message of human solidarity, um, self-solidarity, uh, you know, we can bring this message about how powerful our mind is to everybody. 
And, um, and, and that's our goal. We need to change everybody's subconscious programming so that we can stop being so divided. We know you know that. Um, that's why we love you. That's why we care about you. Um, we're so excited to have you as part of this journey. And also, I will ask you, as always, to stay safe, stay well, and stay soul-focused.